Gene Hackman plays a veteran army sergeant who suspects he may have stumbled onto an international conspiracy in The Package, a new thriller that's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is The Package, an espionage thriller with Gene Hackman assigned a transport and guard, a mercenary soldier, Tommy Lee Jones, from Europe back to prison in the United States. Jones has a very cynical view of the military as he tells Hackman on their way back home. How long you figure before you're back in the place, Johnny? Iran, maybe. Libya, Nicaragua, Philippines, Mexico, maybe. Hey! That's what I signed up to do. Right. You're a patriotic individual, John. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. No? <laughs> you're a mercenary, John. You're a merc for the country you were born in. You know it. Jones, of course, is not who he appears to be, and helping Hackman try to control Jones and still stay alive is Joanna Cassidy in an overwrought role as an army lieutenant colonel and Hackman's ex-wife. Do me a favor and keep your nose out of my P's and Q's. <laughs> That's funny. And secondly, some kind of friend you are. You don't even ask me about my health or my career. How's your health? All you want to talk about is my sex life. How's your career? The two of them were better in Under Fire, but Hackman and Cassidy are both under fire themselves as part of a military plot to undermine peace in the world. Hackman's foe is John Hurd, playing an army colonel who decides that Hackman and Cassidy know too much. Maybe you ought to scrap this thing, Colonel. Maybe we ought to scrap the whole damn country, boy. Ed. That suit you? Suit yourself. I do. You have thus far, otherwise this wouldn't be necessary, would it? Tommy Lee Jones is the best part of this movie. He plays a cynical, no, world-weary killer for hire, and yet he's tough as nails and quite exciting to watch. I only wish that all of the script here was as tough. It's flabby when Joanna Cassidy is involved. Her character could have been thrown away to no great loss. Gene Hackman's character is submerged in all of the action. His role isn't given enough scenes that make him distinctive from other roles that Hackman has played. At the same time, I enjoyed the final confrontation, the tracking of the killer, who wants to change the course of world history. So a mixed review for me on the package. I liked it a little bit more than you did, although I have to agree with you that this is what could almost be described as a Gene Hackman role. This is the kind of role where they say, well, let's get Gene Hackman because he will bring a depth of character to the role that we really haven't put into the screenplay. And in this right. case, they have not made the character not at all. Uh, a, a very special person. But Hackman, of course, has, has these mannerisms, his way of speaking, his way of carrying himself. He's a nice so you guy. get a free ride yeah. when you hire Gene Hackman. Right. Uh, the thing I liked about the movie was this really complex plot, which is really, when you stop after the movie is over to think about it, uh, uh, very nicely constructed. I mean, the way that they're going to pull off this uh, assassination that we don't want to probably give away too much more about than that. Maybe I shouldn't have even said assassination, but Maybe. the way that they want to do this is 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 really tricky and really clever. I thought. Just, but that comes to play in the final, uh, you know, 30 minutes no, but of the No, film. it's unfolding during the whole I movie. Understand I mean, that. right from the point that you see Tommy Lee Jones, the plot is starting. I, under yeah. I understand that, yeah. but I'm talking, I like the way that they actually did the shooting, but I'm not going to give it a positive review. Well, I give it a, at least, a, I give it, I give it thumbs up. Next movie. Our next movie is named Wired, and this is inspired by the life and death of John Belushi, who became the most popular comic actor of his generation and then died of a sordid drug overdose. Belushi's life and death inspired a best-selling book by Watergate journalist Bob Woodward, and the movie is based on the book, although it takes a lot of liberties with Woodward's reporting approach, including the weird plot idea that Belushi's ghost is going to be taken back on a journey through his own life by an angel of death, played by Ray Sharkey. I remember you played a coke addict. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you was a funny guy, man. You was a funny guy. But you died in the end. Sort of like the ghost of Christmas past. Belushi and his friend and partner, Dan Aykroyd, are portrayed in the movie by Michael Chiklis and Gary Grooms, 
who have a real handicap since we all remember so well what they were like in the imitation seems unconvincing. <laughs> The movie even has a character based on Bob Woodward of the Washington Post who interviews Belushi's wife, Judy, played by Lucinda Jenny. He had a life pattern of binges, and not just drugs, and everything. He went through this Napoleonic period, bought all these books on Napoleon, started doing Napoleon, talking in his sleep, just obsessed with Napoleon. And there were all the unhappy details of Belushi's death in this interview with the last person to see him alive. He was alive when I left him this morning. Are you into heroin or anything? No. I was into heroin for a while. That is Patty Darbinville playing Kathy Smith, who administered Belushi's fatal drug overdose. And Darbinville is effective in the role, but in fact, all of the actors in this movie are more or less at sea because the screenplay is so bizarre. How did they ever get the idea of using two different and contradictory devices to tell the same story? While the Woodward character does his reporting on a realistic level, the angel of death is taking poor John Belushi on a tour through his life that, like I said before, it almost seems like an assignment for the ghost of Christmas past. You figure it out. I kept waiting for Woodward to meet the angel of death. Do you remember that story, a famous journalism story, when Bob Considine, 50, 60 years ago, went down to cover the Johnson City flood, and he sent back a story saying, uh, God stood on a mountaintop here and looked at what his flood waters had wrought. And his editor sent him a cable and said, forget flood, interview God. Right. With this movie, I kept expecting Ben Bradley of the Washington Post to send Woodward a cable saying, forget Belushi, interview Angel of it's, Death. It's very difficult to pull off that uh, revisiting your life conceit uh -huh. in a film. It's, it, it's, hard, it's really hard, and it's particularly hard when you're dealing with a contemporary film, when that is such an out there and kind of you know historical thing, like you yeah. said with Dickens. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that works, and that was probably a bad decision. At the same time when I watched the picture I, I didn't uh, get bored because it's an important life and and what happened to his life is obviously quite uh, relevant to the times that we live in uh, I just wish that Bob Fosse the late great director were alive because he could have made this story really well the guy who made star 80 this was a story made for him and it isn't, it isn't well done there could be there obviously could obviously. be a good movie based on the life of John Belushi they have wasted an opportunity here and the irony is is that Woodward was a participated in the making of this film and his book wired yeah. was a very good piece oh, of I reporting so. but the movie it seems to me is just uh, it's almost as if they threw anything they could think of into the screenplay to see what would work and what would I differ with you on one point. I thought that the two guys that played Belushi and Aykroyd uh, were very good in what they had to do. And I did, wasn't uh, offended by watching the portrayal. I bought they the did. mannerisms of, of Aykroyd's character, this is Gary Groove, mm -hmm. absolutely dead on. They did what they could do. Yes. But isn't the problem that these people are so current in your mind mm -hmm. that no matter what these people do, you know that it's not. I think, they, I think these two actors could have pulled it off with a better script and direction. Coming up next, Peter Falk plays a mobster fighting the toughest battle of his life. His daughter doesn't respect him. The comic mob film Cookie is next. Come on, hit me again, you big tough guy. Come you know, on, you can do it. You got a miserable personality. Our next film is called Cookie, yet another mafia comedy, a subject some people don't think is a laughing matter. I just think this film isn't in the same league with the similar wise guys or married to the mob. Peter Falk plays an imprisoned mobster who doesn't get along with his daughter. She even dumps on him when she visits him in the slammer. Take the gum out of your mouth when you're talking to me. You look like a hooker. Once he's free, the two of them continue to be at each other's throat. Even Peter Falk's girlfriend, Diane Wiest, Cookie's mother, can't keep them apart. Listen, I can't stand this. Please, my heart's beating so fast I can't even breathe. Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm getting palpitations. You both stop it! Falk makes an attempt at peaceful coexistence by having his daughter work as his chauffeur. Well, who is it? Feds. Well, you want me to lose him? Do I want to see you lose him? No, I was planning we all go to Playland together, ride the cyclone. That's 
Emily Lloyd as Cookie. There's a very talented cast in this picture, and director Susan Saddleman, who made Desperately Seeking Susan, certainly knows how to make colorful films. But the dominant reaction I had to this picture was, I've been here before. I saw nothing new to distinguish it from other recent mob comedies. And other than an attempt for a few laughs, I didn't really understand what the writers, Nora Ephron and Alice Ireland, were trying to do. Those are good writers. They did Silkwood together. I think that they have good actors here, but a bad script. I don't understand the point of this picture. If I had to pick one word to describe this movie, it would be innocuous, and that's the last word you want to apply to a comedy about the mob. You mentioned Wise Guys and Married to the Mob. Yes. I also mentioned Spike of Bensonhurst, which came out within the last year as movies that cover the same material and covered at a higher energy level with oh, more satire, yeah. with more sharply edged performances, and with a funnier result. This movie is pleasant enough. Uh, I wasn't sitting there appalled by how bad it was, no. but it didn't really, it never really took off and it never really electrified It had me. nothing special about it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I mean, I, when the decision was made to make this picture, what did they think they were doing? I mean, uh, why did this picture have to be made? It didn't have to be made. Coming up next, Fred Savage, the star of TV's The Wonder Years, finds some very strange critters under his bed in Little Monsters. Boo. <laughs> Keep an eye out for monsters! <laughs> Our next movie is named Little Monsters, and because it stars Fred Savage, who's become so popular through the TV show The Wonder Years, it's likely to attract audiences made up of families and younger children. And boy, <laughs> are they going to get a surprise. Little Monsters is one of the most repellent, distasteful, truly creepy movies I've seen in a long time. A movie so unpleasant, I can't really figure out why anybody wanted to make it, and I don't know why anybody would want to see it. The movie is nightmare material all the way through, starting when Fred Savage Savage sets a trap for a monster which his little brother claims lives under the bed. Yeah. It turns out there is a monster in the house and he's played by comedian Howie Mandel. He takes the kid on a trip to the underworld. I love this place. What? All right. The magic word. Oh, I forgot the magic word. It's a... Uh, it's a... Uh, Come on, bud. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that one of the inspirations for this movie was Beetlejuice with its weird otherworldly creatures. Howie Mandel is playing sort of a roadshow version of the Beetlejuice character, but these are really unsavory images that the movie is presenting. You know what happens when I get upset. That's it. I'm upset. What the hell is that? I don't know. That's what happens when I get upset. I don't know who this movie was intended for. It's obviously not for adults who couldn't care less about monsters in the woodwork or under the bed. But it has too many offensive scenes and concepts in it for it to be appropriate for smaller children. And even kids who love monsters are likely to be turned off by the Howie Mandel character. Now, I have to give Mandel credit for a good acting job. He does create an un incredibly unlikable and repulsive monster, and he does a good job of that. It's just that the whole movie feels unwholesome and deeply troubled and really creepy, and I didn't enjoy myself for one second while I was watching it. And afterwards, I thank God that I wasn't eight years old because then I would never be able to go into a bedroom again. Oh, my goodness. Uh uh, first of all, let's get specific because okay. there's obviously some very specific images bothered yeah. you and uh, they bothered me as well. I don't think it's a particularly great idea for a kid's film to show somebody urinating into a uh, apple juice bottle. And then um, giving the juice to another kid to drink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. Putting saran wrap over the toilet seat. Uh, I mean, these are, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they can be funny jokes the way they're handled, I suppose but they don't work in this picture. This, it's like a primer for how to really screw up your whole neighborhood and family. I mean, right. just, and then there's a whole bunch of sequences involving the little kids in the underworld world where they're all dressed up as sort of punk rockers and all this. Mm -hmm. And I just felt sorry for the kids there's that had to put on those costumes. There's a glorification of images of death in the movie. All of the people in that underworld seem to be decayed, That's correct. diseased, uh, uh, depraved in some way or another, yeah. uh, in, in a way that if it is supposed to be funny to kids, it's only funny to kids who are already 
uh, apparently tuned into that kind of sick material. Well, I don't like to think the kids would like that. You know, I, you know the, by knocking this picture so hard, you know, we probably are sending a few people to it uh, out of curiosity. The same stuff could be handled well. By comparison, Beetlejuice is a terrific film. I didn't think it was all that great, but by comparison, that film had a little joy to it. This is kind of depressing. Right. Coming up next, The Little Thief, Francois Truffaut's story of a troubled teenage girl in post-war France. Our next film is from France. It's called The Little Thief, and it has an interesting pedigree. When the late Francois Truffaut made his new wave film, The 400 Blows, in 1959, it originally was supposed to be about a boy and a girl. Well, the film, of course, ended up being only about the boy. And now, 30 years later, using a story that Truffaut had long wanted to shoot himself, we finally get the girl's movie. Her name is Janine, and she's a rebellious little thief, a 16-year-old living in France in 1950. She's sent away from home after being arrested for stealing from the church, and the little thief, to its credit, does not romanticize that young woman. She has some exciting adventures, but the film makes it plain that she is quite miserable until at the end when she becomes more life-affirming, more willing not to grab for immediate pleasure. This picture, however, is not in the same class as other recent films we've seen about young French women on their own coming of age, such pictures as Vagabond. If Truffaut had lived, he might have made this film a little bit darker, I think. As directed by Claude Miller, with a script by some other people, the story of a lost youth seems too familiar and really not distinctive. I can't recommend The Little Thief, despite a strong performance by Charlotte Gainsbourg in the title role. I was disappointed too, and the thing that disappointed me was the tra trajectory of the movie because it seemed to me that what we were missing was really the sense that this girl was changing. And the first shot of the movie, she's already a thief. Mm -hmm. She continues to be a thief throughout the movie. Just the and you can see that what she's doing is she's, her feeling is if I can steal something and give it to somebody that I love, I can buy their love in that way. Well, it doesn't work that way, but she doesn't really find that out until right at the end of the movie. Now, obviously, the key event in her life is when she's given a camera. And with this camera, she is now going to become a photographer. That could kind of symbolize what happened to Truffaut. Right, he was a thief. Life as a young Jew and out of Lincoln was redeemed by his love of the movies. But what they do in this film is they give you the whole bad period of this girl's life, and then right at the end, they just put some words up on the screen saying after she got the camera, after then all she right. told was the images of other people. Now that's something Truffaut used to do too, where he would give you the rest of the story in a little title at the end of the film, and it used to irritate me then too, because it seems to me that that belongs in the film, that that's part of the film, and they had less of the thieving and more of the redemption so that you saw the entire span of this girl's experience, it would have been a better Well, movie. I, I, I want to say that I, I don't think the film is tough enough on, on her life in the beginning either. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, I, I realize this is 1950, but it's, <laughs> it, the, the picture's set in 1950, but um, I, I think that her life should have been a little more harsh than we were actually shown. It seems to want to just have fun with the uh, her, her little affairs in some way, and I think uh, the world's a little harder than that. I think that The 400 Blows was actually harder. It was, it was cruel what was happening yeah. to him, and, and with her it's a little bit sugar-coated. If there is one thing you can say for the movie, though, it is sort of a last postcard from Truffaut, who wrote a 45-page treatment for the story, who might have made a different movie from it, for all we know. I suspect but he would have. Been. We sure do miss him, that's for sure. Let's take another look now at the movies we reviewed on this show. We had a slightly split decision on the package, the thriller about international intrigue. I like the ingenious plot. Gene was disappointed in the Gene Hackman character. Two thumbs down for Wired, the story of the life and death of John Belushi. It was undercut by a weird script and uncertain direction, but Gene liked it a little more than I did. Two thumbs down for Cookie, the mafia family comedy with Peter Falk and Emily Lloyd. It was pleasant enough, but not compelling. Two thumbs way down for Little Monsters with Fred Savage in a surprisingly distasteful comedy. And finally, two more negative votes for The Little Thief, the story of a troubled French girl based on the last project of Francois Truffaut. Well, I want to make one more point on Little Monsters. Again, being specific, I left it out. There's a lot of foul language just thrown out gratuitously in scenes with Fred Savage standing right there. And I would have thought he would have said, hey, leave my audience alone. The people who made this movie must have been really jaded and cynical and totally out of touch with the innocence of childhood to think that a movie like this would be appropriate for young audiences. They're ripping off Beetlejuice badly. That's it for this week. Next time we'll be back with a show called Hollywood's Hidden Stars. Four actors and actresses who we think deserve more praise than they've been getting recently. A special show next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Nestle Crunch. It's creamy milk chocolate and crispy crunchies. Chocolate is scrunchious when it crunches. That's why you'll love Nestle Crunch. 
KitchenAid Double Door Refrigerator, Trash Compactor, Portable Convertible Dishwasher, and Solid State Touch Options Washer Dryer. All in almond. KitchenAid, for the way it's made. Travel Savers, the nation's leading chain of independent travel agencies. Consult your yellow pages for the Travel Savers agency nearest you. Ask for our specially priced cruises. Travel Savers. The Plockman family has been making quality mustard since 1852. Enjoy their mild yellow, Dijon, and stone ground mustards.